Hi, my name is Dr. Aaron Sullivan and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Birmingham Shakespeare Institute. And during this strange time when all of us are at home, running around, trying to figure out what the future may bring, we at the Shakespeare Institute wanted to keep a little bit of our Shakespeare work going um, and to share it with the public. So we're taking it in turns to talk a little bit about our research um, in the hopes that it might be of interest to some of you out there. For me, it's been a very strange time as it has been for everyone, um, but in particular for my research because I've spent the last several years actually working on the streaming and broadcasting of theater. So the recording of theater and then the broadcasting of it to cinemas, but also the streaming of it online. Um, so as many of you will know, the streaming of online performing arts um, has just exploded over the last month through the generosity of so many different theaters and artists. Um, and it's raised a lot of interesting questions about what theater looks like now and what it might look like in the future. Um, for me, it's very interesting because coming into the world of performance studies, uh, I found myself surprised at first by how strongly so many of my peers felt that theater was very much always about being in the same room, the audience and the performers. And it makes a lot of sense because that is the core essence of what we have often come to know as a theatrical experience. But perhaps because I grew up in the suburban South in the United States, where there really wasn't much by way of professional theater, um, I had a little bit of a different experience. I certainly did participate in and go to live in-person theater um, at my school or at a community center. But one of my first really transformative theatrical experiences happened on television. Um, in the early 1990s, the original Broadway cast of Into the Woods with Bernadette Peters and many other great performers uh, was recorded and broadcast, not live, but post live um, on PBS, which is a public broadcasting station in the US. Um, and I saw it as a child and was absolutely transfixed. It completely captured my imagination and it really made me think at a different level about what theatrical experience could be, the kind of talent that people brought to it, both in terms of the performers on stage, but also the people writing music, book, drama, everything. Um, so for me, I think that experience of seeing something so, so exciting at such a young age and feeling so moved by it and so inspired to pursue art in many different forms, but especially in the form of theater um, in my own personal and eventually professional life has given me maybe a slightly different perspective on some of these questions about what has to be present for theater, quote unquote, to be there. So about 10 years ago, some people will know that the National Theatre in London started its NT Live project, where it live broadcasts very high quality, high definition recordings of many of its main stage productions to cinemas, at first around the UK, but now around the world. Um, and of course, there's been so much interesting work and discussion and debate and controversy even that's arisen from these projects about whether broadcast recorded performances will draw audiences away from live theater, will kill it off, whether it threatens regional theater or touring, um, but also the ways in which it might develop new audiences, allow people to experience theater who might not have the chance otherwise. Um, many different questions have gone around with it. And for me, it's, it's ended up inspiring a few different lines of research. So the first thing that really interested me was thinking about the creative aspect of these broadcasts, how they're created, um, and the, the techniques, the filmic techniques they use to capture and interpret and present theater for screen audiences. Um, so many people, myself included, when you first see a broadcast, might be tempted to think that it's kind of a, a documentary capture, that it's just, that's the way the production is. Um, but some of you might already be thinking, actually, but there's got to be lots of different cameramen and, uh, and directors involved in that process of filming and editing and producing this experience for a screen, a different medium than it was originally intended. And you would be absolutely right. So I've been really interested in the way, the kinds of shots that are used in broadcasts 
um, the extent to which they move close in, like in this early shot from a 2013 production of Othello at the National Theatre, um, and the kind of intimate, emotion-driven perspective that that kind of closer shot can give to a theatre audience. That image was from a production that was put on in the National Theatre's Olivier Auditorium, which is their largest auditorium. I think it seats about a thousand people. Really no one in the audience, even if you were in the front row, would have that kind of view if you were there in person. So you're getting a different kind of access that's intimate, um, almost as if you're on screen or you're on stage, part of the conversation. At the same time, you're getting something that doesn't give you much information about the space that you're in, um, the way that the actors move through that space, which is often considered one of the hallmarks of theatrical activity. So it's interesting to me to think about how, what kind of experience for a spectator that sort of closer shot creates versus longer shots like these. This is from the opening moments of uh, a Royal Shakespeare Company broadcast in 2014, Richard II. Um, in a shot like this, you have a pretty clear view of almost the entire stage. You actually have audience members as well on the left and right. Um, so, you know, this would be a very good seat in the house, <laughs> but it is nevertheless a seat in the house. It is quite a theatrical perspective. Um, so I'm very interested in the ways that camera directors might mix a theatrical with a televisual perspective and also the ways in which they might use kind of um, uh, virtuosic techniques crane cameras that zoom down or creep in to create something that we might think of as cinematic and how these different modes of filming come together to create a new medium that is the high definition theater broadcast that has been on the rise over the last 10 years. So that's something that I wrote about in my article called The Forms of Things Unknown, Shakespeare and the Rise of the Live Broadcast. Um, and through the generosity of the publisher at the moment, that article is available open access if people would like to read more or just look at other pictures from broadcasts. Um, it's worth question asking at this point, but what does Shakespeare have to do with any of this? Because it's definitely the case that all different forms of theater have been filmed and broadcast over this past decade. Um, but it's really interesting to me that Shakespeare is one of the central figures and in fact is the preeminent playwright, as it were, in the live broadcast canon that has developed around the National Theatre and of course when it, you know, with the Royal Shakespeare Company as they've been broadcasting. And I think that's for many reasons. I think absolutely, it's absolutely linked to Shakespeare's position in so many global school curricula um, in the UK. He's a compulsory author in the schoolroom. And that's also the case in other countries around the world. Um, I think that his recognizability, his cultural clout has something to do with it as well. Um, it's sort of a risky venture. It's very expensive putting together these broadcasts. So you need to guarantee a certain baseline audience. And I think that recognizable authors um, like Shakespeare, sometimes also like um, classical Greek writers or um, you know, very well-known contemporary playwrights are more likely to be broadcast um, than perhaps lesser known works or more experimental works um, so that an audience can be, um, if not insured, at least more likely. Um, so that work really focused on the creation of these broadcast recordings. But I've also been interested very much in the reception. So thinking about the audiences and theater is what is on stage, but it's also what's happening in the auditorium, your experience as a viewer or a listener to what's going on. Um, and with broadcasts, an interesting thing is that there are new ways of thinking about audiences and certainly of researching audiences have opened up, um, not least through audiences' use of social media. So something I worked on a few years ago was looking at how different audience members uh, tweeted before, in the, during, and after two different broadcast performances. Um, and one of them was uh, Kenneth Branagh Theatre Company's Romeo and Juliet, which was broadcast to cinemas. And so in that case, I was mostly looking at sets of tweets that were um, sent out before, during the interval, and then after the production. And I was really interested in the ways in which people um, sort of celebrated their sense of experience, event, belonging, often uh, talked about where they were watching from. So there was a very strong sense of local place, even though these messages were going out to a global community. Um, and I looked at those messages and tweets 
in comparison with um, a, an online broadcast that happened in 2016 at the Globe Theatre in London. That was Emma Rice's A Midsummer Night's Dream. That production was streamed online as part of the celebrations around the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. And it actually meant that people not only tweeted before and after the production, but also throughout it. Basically live tweeted in a way that's become familiar um, in terms of how some people watch television, um, but it's very different for the theater where certain you know, edi etiquette, uh, rules of etiquette and codes of behavior um, would traditionally prohibit that kind of discussion and connection during a production. So I looked at, I managed to uh, bring together, to reap thousands of different tweets from both events um, and analyze them in different ways. And the graphs you're looking at, the one on the left is a visualization of some of the data from the Romeo and Juliet cinema broadcast production I was talking about. And the one on the right is from the Midsummer Night's Dream online broadcast. And you'll probably notice, first of all, that there are lots of dots for each of them. And those dots represent the tweets that were sent out um, about those productions. And it shows you that in both cases, there was quite a lot, thousands. Um, and that's just the ones that used a certain set of hashtags um, that made them findable for me. But you'll also notice that the one on the right, there are many different lines connecting those dots. And what those lines represent are when different people are tweeting to one another. So they're not just tweeting out into the world or back to the theater company that's organizing the event, but they're actually starting to comment back and forth to one another. Um, it's called a chain network analysis, and, and they're basically creating a chain of communication through these tweets. And that really interested me because one of the things that people are worried about often when it comes to broadcast theater is the possibility that they're, that you, you aren't able to come together as an audience, that you don't have that sense of collectivity um, or as uh, of unity. And although I absolutely agree that in many ways that sense of collectivity is very different and very much disrupted. You're not in the room together, breathing the same air, um, you know, looking at the exact same thing on stage. Nevertheless, I think that there are a lot of other ways in which collectivity and unity can be created. Um, and certainly through the process of talking about a production as it evolves, although in many ways, a lot for a lot of us in theater, myself included at one point in time, would see this as kind of heresy, as totally unorthodox behavior. Nevertheless, I think that actually that sort of communication can be really valuable in creating a sense of event and a sense of community. Because one thing many people who are watching online theater said was that getting to talk with one another as it happened made them feel like they were really part of something special that was happening now in events. Um, and they also said that it helped them think harder about certain moments in productions, things that you might take in individually and maybe not really know what to do with it, but talking through it a bit with others, whether it was people they knew or new people they connected with through the internet, um, helped them dig deeper into some of those points that kind of struck them and really interested them. So that work is something that I wrote up in an essay called The Audience is Present, Aliveness, Social Media, and the Theater Broadcast Experience. And although the article isn't available in full for free, um, the book is in paperback, but also there's a partial view of it available online for free through Google Books, and the link is there. Um, in this article, I proposed this term aliveness as a kind of adjacent term to the more traditional liveness. We often think of theater as something that is live, and the liveness is what gives it life. Um, but I actually think that aliveness maybe in this digital world might be a more useful term um, because what we're finding, many different researchers in different fields are finding, is that the word live is actually quite slippery and that it moves as our goalposts move. So as live, at one point in time, it had to be you're in the same place at the same time. And then it was, well, maybe you're not in the same place, but it's the same time. It's a radio broadcast. Um, but actually, a lot of broadcasts happen, although things like NT Live originated as programs that would broadcast theater in the live moment. Um, there's been lots of instances where actually they are continue, uh, they uh, broadcast again after the fact. These are often called encore performances. And that might be because of time zone. If you want to broadcast to Australia, for instance, um, it's not really going to work to do it live um, or other parts of the world as well. So it might be a few days later, or even a few weeks. 
Um, and a lot of audiences have said that it is possible for the occasion to still feel eventful and exciting, even though it's not live in that more traditional sense. And for me, that's a kind of aliveness, a kind of spark that brings the event to life in a way that's meaningful for the people who are there. And we're certainly seeing these questions uh, come up even more rapidly in this new context of us looking at so much theater online, because most of it isn't live. Most of it has been recorded before and it's being played again online or in some cases on television for people to watch and enjoy during this time when none of us can go to a physical theater and be there live. Um, so it's giving us a lot of food for thought right now. And some of you guys might be hopefully watching different kinds of performing arts broadcasts in different uh, digital venues. One of the biggest ones um, goes back to that NT Live program that I was talking about earlier. The National Theatre has, during the month of April, made four of its NT Live recordings available for free to the public. And they've been broadcasting them on YouTube, actually. Um, so this is a still from Jane Eyre. Um, they're also going to be broadcasting, or depending on when you watch this podcast, they have broadcast um, Twelfth Night. Um, and what they're doing is making it available at 7 p.m. UK time on a Thursday evening and inviting people to watch live then, um, but leaving the recording there for the course of a week so that people can also watch kind of in catch up as you were and, and watch again. Um, it's interesting to me to look at the setup that they have here. YouTube is, you know, a very powerful, popular platform. Um, it has different features that are really interesting. So you've got a live chat going on at the right of the screen that some audience members might get involved in. There's also a very um, you know, active discussion each time that there's a new broadcast out going on on Twitter with an assigned hashtag. In addition to that, you have things like um, a donation button. Um, and even before all of this happened, there were huge questions in the theater sector about the economics of digital theater. Um, and whether it would put theaters out of business, whether it would actually attract new um, audience members who would come and pay in the theater, whether digital content, there's just such an expectation for it to be free that you have to capitulate to that or whether you can charge for it. And all of these are very live questions, if you will, right now, and ones that certainly aren't answered. Um, it's a time of great upheaval for those in the culture sector. Um, it for many different reasons, but certainly for financial reasons. So what the National Theatre has gone with is a, a plan where they distribute for free, but they invite donations. Um, and obviously they're also um, a government funded organization. So they have that income stream, um, which is a bit different from organizations that are entirely commercial. But in any case, it raises a lot of questions for us about what's, what, what is happening now with theatre and whether what we're watching um, as a stream, whether we experience it as a theatrical event, whether it feels like something else to us. Um, and I'll certainly be, I'm trying to watch as much as I can during this period of time uh, to think, to help think through some of these questions. Um, right before, kind of, I've been working on the subject of online stream theater most of last year and actually wrote up an article at the end of last year that's about to be published. Um, and it'll be available open access for free from May um, that is very much about stream theater and audience experience and what it's like to be at the theater in your living room. Now this article was written just before, a couple of months before um, this global crisis that we're all going through. So it doesn't um, reflect in full or even at all on what we're experiencing now, but it does I suppose, supply the kind of backstory to what we're experiencing now. Um, and some of the things that I point out about streamed theater versus cinematic broadcast theater um, are perhaps above all, the different ways in which people watch. The fact that when you're watching something at home, almost inevitably people end up doing other things, other things that they certainly wouldn't do in a live theater audience, but that they also wouldn't do in a cinema theater audience. So when something's coming into your house, it gets folded into the different rhythms of domestic life. You know, in the evening, it gets folded into cooking dinner or eating it or doing the washing up or putting children to bed or taking phone calls from parents who might need to be checked in on all different kinds of things, doing some of the hoovering, trying to catch up on emails from work. 
Um, and I found in my research, which this article in particular was based on surveys conducted with people who had watched a particular broadcast, that was a Midsummer Night's Dream at the Globe again, um, I found that people by and large did at least a couple of other things, often many more things while they watched. And it poses both opportunities and challenges. The challenges are is that it, it detracts from our attention. It perhaps doesn't give us as deep or focused of an experience of theater. Um, on the other hand, it can potentially enliven critical thinking around certain moments of performance. And that especially came out um, with people who were, again, using different kinds of social media or social communication to talk about the production as it went on. It became very clear that talking about what you see helps uh, create new meaning for you about what it what it's doing. So it can be a really enriching experience to do other things or do things differently while you watch than what is the traditional way of going to the theater. But on the other hand, of course, it is more fragmented, sometimes more thinned out, um, more disruptive. It perhaps gives us a less intense relationship to the performing arts where it might be going on, if not in the background, then alongside many other things. Um, and I think that both theater makers and theater goers will be trying to figure out how to navigate these different dynamics as we go forward. And we'll certainly also be thinking about where that will leave us when we get back to some sort of new normal in the future. So with that, I'll leave you um, and certainly invite you to watch some sort of performing arts streamed event during this time, even if it's just for a few minutes. I mean, I've certainly found that I've been watching things in installments. I have a young child and sitting down for three hours isn't really possible, um, both in practical terms that I just don't have that time, but also um, in other practical terms that I can't stay awake for that long anymore. Uh, there's just so much else going on. We're all stretched in so many ways, emotionally exhausted. Um, so I've started finding that I'm watching things in 30 minute or one hour chunks, kind of episodes of productions, which, you know, if I go back to that young person um, watching that PBS broadcast of Into the Woods, that, that young person would have never thought that I could really be involved in and invested in a theatrical experience when I'm chopping it up and watching it in that way. But I suppose one thing I realize as I grow older is that, you know, we we grow alongside theater and it has to grow alongside us and we have to find different ways of experiencing art and beauty in our lives ways that work and that make sense in the context that we're in so that's what i'm doing right now um, and i invite you all to do the same <laughs>